Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so let's begin. Um, okay, first of all, thanks everyone for joining. Um, all right, so we're going to continue our discussion about about uh, or on world history. Uh, so last time we got together, uh, we talked about uh, a general overview of uh, of the history. We went from literally from beginning to end in about an hour, and so now, like we said last time, we'll go back and discuss different periods of time. So um, so we're starting from the beginning. Um, so we'll run through a lot of the basic um, the basic stuff. Uh, the stories of the Chumash and so on uh, briefly, and then we'll spend more time on the on the later um, the latest segments in history, which are somewhat less known. So, as we all know uh, from the stories of the Chumash, uh, it says in the beginning that God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day He rested. On the seventh day of creation, on the excuse me, the sixth day of creation, Hashem created the first two people, Adam and Chava. Um, after that. It says on the seventh day Hashem rested. Uh, we all know uh, that on Friday itself, um, the commandment was was that they should not eat from the Eitz Adas, the, the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge is the the tree of knowledge between good and evil. Um, sometimes that part is uh, is missed out. That it's the, it's the tree of knowledge between good and evil. In other words, when, once they would eat it, or that once they would eat from the tree, so then they would understand or have their eyes would be open to see the the value uh, of evil versus versus goodness and that's exactly what happened and they were given free choice um, so the free choice that exists today is something that was put into action or something that was um, that was activated uh, through the eating of the of the Eitzadas, through the eating from the Eitzadas, uh from the from the tree now there's a lot there's a lot of uh, Opinions and arguments as to what exactly the tree was, and according to one opinion or or some opinions, the the um, the the prohibition of eating from the tree of life, the, excuse me, the tree of knowledge, was was only for several hours. It wasn't forever. Hashem only wanted that they should not eat from the tree of knowledge until Shabbos, uh, which ter- comes out depending on uh, on the different ways of counting. You're talking about. Uh, about three hours, three, four, five hours, something like that. Um, and for whatever reason, Adam and Chav did not withstand this test, and they ate from the tree of knowledge. Hashem thereafter uh, sent them out of the of the garden, and He said that if well, we will leave you here, or if if you will be allowed to remain, so then uh, so then you leave from the tree of life. Um, and as so this explains. Uh, you know, where did this tree of life come from? There wasn't any any time before this that suddenly uh, that uh, this is the first time we're hearing of this tree of life thing. There was no prohibition prior to this that uh, that other Machaba were not supposed to eat from the tree of life. Uh, and then suddenly, after they ate from the tree of knowledge, Hashem said that you should not. We, we need to go out of the garden because if you remain in the garden, you will um, you'll eat from the tree of life um, and and then live forever. That's what the tree of life is. Just like the tree of knowledge gives you knowledge between good and evil, so the tree of life gives you life. So eternal life, which is what Hashem wanted to begin with. Hashem never intended that people should die. The original intention was that Adam and Chava should live in the garden, and they should live forever, and that's it. So Chassidus explains that, of course, that once they sin, so then the 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 the, the klippa of the sinning of the sins that they that they did and that they would subsequently do and that people future generations would subsequently do because of what happened with the tree of life with the tree of knowledge because they ate from it because they 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 brought free choice free choice allows for the opportunity to to uh to choose not to do what hashem wants that's what free choice is is that i can choose to or not to so ultimately so ultimately hashem said that that if you'll continue to live forever, so then all of your sins, all of the things that you've done that are inappropriate, will live together with you, and uh, and so therefore that has to, that clip has to die and end at a certain point, and so therefore Hashem sent the Adam and Chava out of the garden, and um, and and Adam's lifespan was set for a thousand years. Adam and Chava's lifespan was set for a thousand years. They were supposed to be the two people that would live for the longest amount of time. Um, ultimately, however, um, Adam 
who was shown all future generations, all future generations, uh, saw uh, an individual by the name of David. And uh, he saw him as, uh, as, as, as someone with, with tremendous potential and a very, very special soul. And he also saw that he was destined to die at childbirth. And he asked, why is he going to die at childbirth? And wh why won't he be given an opportunity to, um, to affect the world? Um, and, uh, and Hashem said that if, uh, that he, cause he does, he doesn't have years. If, if you'd be willing to give him years, so then, uh, so then he'll be able to do uh, things in the world that, uh, that you feel that he would be able to do. So, um, so he agreed, he agreed and he gave 70 years of his life. This, this uh, David was, uh, uh, as, as we know, uh, David Amalek, David ben Yishai the first uh, kid, uh, uh, king of Israel, or the second king of Israel after Shaul, and he was the one who, be, who started the Davidic dynasty. And till today, the, the Allah is, is, that, is that all kings must come from the children of David. The Mashiach himself will also be a descendant from not only Shevet Yehuda, but also the descendant of David and, um, and Shlema. Um, okay, so Adam and Chavar sent out of the garden. Uh, they spent, uh, according to some opinions, according to some opinions, the the um, uh, Cain and Hevel, their two children, were also conceived and born in the Garden of Eden, in Gan Eden. Uh, and, and, uh, other opinions uh, says that it was afterwards, but either way, uh, the story continues with Cain and Hevel uh, in the world in the land of Kedem. Um, and it says there they, uh, that one was uh, a shepherd, uh, Hevel was a shepherd, and Cain uh, worked the land. Um, and uh, at one point, uh, Cain decided that he wanted to bring a carbon, he wanted to bring a, 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 an offering to Hashem, but he didn't bring an offering um, that, was, that was from the best. He didn't bring the best to Hashem, he brought uh, the worst or, or mediocre. And then Hevel did the same thing, but Hevel brought um from the best of his flock he brought a sacrifice from the best of his sheep and hashem accepted the the offering of, of hevel he sent down a fire onto the altar that he had built and uh, and he consumed the the, the carbon as opposed to cayenne's the vegetables that he brought that he had grown in his uh in his land hashem did not accept and so jealousy began there's other, there's other reasons also brought in different midrashim about why Cain was jealous of of hevel one Opinion is is that is that they were born with twins, um, and Hevel was born with two twins, while Cain was only born with one, and and Cain was jealous of that. And there's other opinions also, other midrashim that say why one was uh, one was jealous of the other, um, but uh, but but jealousy is ultimately the uh, the symptom of klipas and of sinning, and that's what it says when Mashiach comes. There will be no there will be no jealousy and no competition and so on. So this is this is what happens when we when. Um, you know, it's a symptom of the of the Eitz Adas. Um, okay, so the, this famous story continues that they got into a fight. They got into a fight, uh, Cain and Hevel, or the, according to some opinions, they were fighting for a long time about different things. And then finally, Cain decided that he's going to kill his brother Hevel. Um, and it says that at that point, that he had no idea how someone died, because no one had died yet uh, up until that point. He, they knew that there was a concept of death because Hashem said that they were going to die, but they didn't know uh, how or, or how that happens, or how you hasten the, the death, how, do you, how you murder someone. So it says that he took the, a farming tool and he started to hit uh, Hevel in all types of different places because he didn't know from where the neshama goes out or comes in. And so he hit him and hit him and hit him in all types of different places until he hit him in the head. And when he hit him in the head, he fell down to the ground and he bled out. Uh, Hashem called out to Cain. He says, where's your brother? And the famous line that Cain said, the famous uh, famous quote that people use until today, he says, Hashem anechi, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, which is, of course, uh, a way of, uh, of not answering. And uh, he said, uh, and he said, your brother's blood screams out for me from the earth. Um, according to some Midrashim, it says that Cain, uh, that, that, that Hevel stayed uh, where he was. He was not buried, and he stayed there uh, until, for, for many, many years. And because he was a tzaddik, his body didn't decompose. 
But nevertheless, uh, according to one opinion in the Midrashim, it says that he, he was not buried because they didn't know, uh, just like Cain didn't know how to murder someone, he also didn't know, um, he also didn't know that, that after a person dies or is after a person is killed, they're supposed to be buried or what the process is or what a, what's supposed to be done with the, with the dead body. So there's different opinions in Midrashim, when he was buried and, and how and so on. So some people say that, um, some opinions say that, 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 that Chava saw a bird burying um, burying another bird, and so therefore she understood that that's what uh, she's supposed to do. And uh, and other opinions is that Hashem told her. Other opinions is that it didn't happen till much much later when when Chava died, and nine hundred nine nine hundred thirty years later when when she died, um, that Adam was told what to do with her, and then he also knew what to do with Hevel. All right. Anyways, a few different all these different madrashim uh, that uh, that discuss what uh, what could have happened. Um, after that, it says that Adam and Chava divorced each other, and for 130 years they were not married. Um, and and they said to the, to each other, they said, if our if our children are going to kill each other, and this is the outcome of the sin that we made, uh, the sin that we did in in in, in Gan Eden, that uh, that we ate from the Eitz Hadas. Um, uh, so then, uh, and you know, and this is going to be this is going to be the the outcome of humanity. This is what's going to happen today. Uh, or with all future generations, that there's going to be all this jealousy and murder and, 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 and deceit and so on. So then forget it. It's just not worth it. Well, why should we bring more children into the world and populate the world when this is what the world is going to look like? And so they decided to separate um, and to do tshuva and to see um, and to see if they uh, if they could change something and so on. According to one of the midrashim, it says that they didn't understand the concept of tshuva until much later, where it says that uh, that Hashem uh, punished Cain because of what he did to Hevel, because he murdered Hevel, and and, and he showed tr- uh, true remorse after he heard the, the severity of the punishment, even though it was only because of the severity of the punishment. He wasn't really remorseful uh, just because he did something terrible. He was remorseful because uh, because well, you know he was shocked when he heard the the intensity of the of the uh, of the punishment. Um, and he realized that uh, he realized that he would die. Or that he would not, uh, that his descendants wouldn't live uh, long, or that his lineage wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't populate the world, and he was very shocked in this with, with this, and he showed remorse. And even though the remorse was only um, because of the punishment, Hashem uh, uh, lessened his punishment. And when Adam found out about this, he understood that there was this concept of tshuva. That's one opinion. Other opinions said, of course, that they knew that the, that the, that that tshuva existed always. Other people say that Chava's whole reason for eating from the Eitzadas, which is a more of a Kabbalistic Hasidic interpretation, that Chava's whole reason for eating the Eitzadas was in order to bring the concept of tshuva in the world. Because if you don't have sinning, so then you don't have a concept of tshuva, and a person can reach much much greater heights through tshuva than than uh, than being a tzaddik their whole life, and that's what she wanted for her children. That's a the Hasidic interpretation. Um, fine. So after after 130 years, the Adam and Chava decided that they're going to get back together again, and they had another child by the name of Shays. Shays. So Cain's lineage died out. Um, Cain was killed, and his, his grandson was killed, and, and and whoever was left was either died out or was killed in the Mabel. Um, and the flood with Nayach, and then, and, and so all people that exist today come from Shays. Hevel didn't have any children, Cain's whole lineage died out, and the only people that exist today exist from Nayach. Nayach was a descendant of Shays, uh, who lived nine generations later, and all the people that li- exist today are B'nai Nayach, or the children of Nayach. Okay. Um, so from Adam until Nayach, there was ten generations. Uh, a few notable people, uh, um, um, there was a man by the name of Hanoich. Hanoich only lived for a shortened period of time. Um, he lived only for a few hundred years. And the reason for that was is because Hashem saw that if he was going to live longer, that he was going to begin to sin. And at that point, he was completely righteous. And he was a person that, that served Hashem and brought a lot of people to, to serve Hashem. And so he was a big tzaddik, and he was a person that brought a lot of people to the, to, to, to the correct way. At this time already, the beginnings of idolatry started to, to started to begin. The way idolatry started was that people said that the farther and farther away that we get from creation, the feeling was, based on the, the experience, the human experience, was that Hashem is getting farther and farther away from humanity, or farther and farther away from the world. 
And so they came up with this, uh, or, or their feeling was, or the, what, what they felt was, was happening, was that Hashem created the world. And after Hashem created the world, um, people, uh, Hashem slowly backed away or was backing away, meaning he created uh, all types of different, um, all types of different uh, uh, ministers, so to speak, to um, to govern the world, which are which are the sun and the zodiac and the stars and and, and the moon, etc., and, and other forces that be the wind and the weather and the the, so on, so the rain, etc. And all these things dictate uh, how produce is is is, uh, is is grown or if produce is grown, the weather, the the, the heat, the cold, etc. Um, all of this is based on the the sun, the moon, and the stars. And a person's mazel is, of course, also seen in the stars or dictated by the stars of the zodiac. Um, that's a person's mazel. And so therefore, and they saw, they understood all of these great uh, celestial beings and their great wisdom and their great powers and so on. And so they said, they didn't, they, they, they didn't start off by saying that, that, that God doesn't exist. They started off by saying that Hashem created the world. He created the world in order to, uh, uh, you know, he created the world and then he wasn't planning on governing it or, or, or running it hands-on. And he gave it over to, to, to management. Just like a person has a company, they start the company, they get it running for a few years, and then afterwards they start to hire people, and they hire management, middle management, lower management, etc. And they have and they hire employees and so on. And just like any other company, it runs that way, and uh, and then the CEO doesn't isn't involved in the day to day uh, little nitty gritty details. So that's what they felt that was going on with Hashem, and that Hashem had uh, had, had had left the world. In reality, however, that's we, we know that's not true. The world runs by Shachapratis, that everything that happens in the world, down to the most, most minutest detail, is run by Hashem. However, the feeling of Hashem's presence in the world became less because of the Averis of each person's generation. There's, there was the Averis of, that, that Adam and Chava created, did or committed. And then there was, of course, Kain and Hevel. And then there was the, 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 this whole concept that Hashem is leaving the world and so on. And, and the Averis that they did and the, the process that they started. And so they pushed God out. Um, like the famous, uh, the famous story with the Kutzke that uh, that uh, the Kutzke asked one of his chassidim, uh, "Where is where is God?" And so he said, "What do you mean? He's he's everywhere, uh, right?" The famous children's song that Hashem is here and Hashem is there and Hashem is truly everywhere. So he didn't understand what he was asking, and the so Kutzke told him that Hashem is. So he so the chassid asked, asked the Kutzke, he says, "Okay, so if I'm not saying the right answer, so what is the answer?" So he said that Hashem is everywhere where you let him in. Wherever you invite him to, so when the so when uh, the the people so so as people began to sin more and more, um, so it became so Hashem distanced himself from the world more and more, at least from the human experience. Um, and this continued and continued and continued until the time of Nayach. A little bit before Nayach, there was an, an individual by the name of Mr. Shalach, um, otherwise known as Methuselah in English. And he was the he he ended up living although Adam was supposed to be the longest living person because he gave seventy years to David Amelach, he and only lived till nine thirty. So Mr. Mr. Shalach was the person that lived for the longest amount of time. He lived several several generations before Nayach, and um, and Nayach uh, and he lived for nine hundred and sixty nine years. It says that he died right before the Mabel, which gives you a, a, an indication of how. Um, of how long he lived, or how long which before the Mabel he lived. Uh, it says that the Mabel was timed. Uh, he was also at Sadiq, and and um, and the Mabel was timed to begin exactly seven days after his death. So, uh, in, in order for to allow for the family to bury him and to sit Shiva, uh, so exactly seven days after Mr. Shalach died, the rain started, and uh, of course, 120 years before. Um, um, Noach uh, was told by God to build a teva, build a, a, a boat. Uh, now, what's interesting, or, or maybe a, a less known fact that it says in Medrash, is that is that um, is that Hashem came to Noach and He told him, and He came to others also. He came to Mr. Shalach and He came to others in the generation. He told them that 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 uh, that the idolatry has become uh, great and the immorality has become great, and people ultimately. Ultimately, 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 Hashem says that I can handle all of these things, or I can, I, I can swallow, I can, I can deal with all these things. But the main thing that really bothers me is that people are not nice to each other. There is no um, what we call today Avos Yisrael. There's no, uh, 
people people are exceedingly mean to each other, which is which is what, which is what it says in the pasuk. There's that the world had become full of robbery, which is a funny thing uh, because there were so many immoral things that were going on. Um, but the thing that sticks out in the pasuk, the thing that the pasuk mentions, is that there was robbery. So it's funny to think that the robbery is the thing that caused. The Mabel. but in reality, this is what Hashem was was bothered by the most: is that the people didn't uh, didn't respect or love or care for each other. Which is, by the way, just to jump forward um, uh, about uh, about um, you know what? I don't know that I don't know how many years. But in the time of Ramavinu, ten generations later, when Ramavinu was a child, so the people. That, uh, that that repopulated the earth decided to make this tower. It's called the Tower of Bavel, and and it was in, in order to fight against God. They were they were making a tower in order to reach the heavens and to fight against God to 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 kill God to 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 make sure that God stayed in heaven, or, or, or you know different people had different ideas about what it is that they were making the ta- the tower for, and this tower um, was was a but 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 the, the, the tower was a clear. A sign of war against God, and God didn't destroy them, and He didn't kill them. He didn't send another flood, even a partial flood, or or some sort of uh, plague or whatever. He just dispersed them. He made them all speak different languages, and people people uh, people dispersed to different places. Um, and the reason why they dispersed to different places, uh, or the reason why Hashem 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 caused them to disperse to different places, and He didn't kill them, or He didn't uh, do something or punish them in one way or another. Uh, is because they worked together and they had uh, and they cared for each other, um, and there was achdos, there was unity amongst the people that were that were there. So that's, it shows it's a very very powerful thing, uh, unity and love between people. So um, uh along the lines of a person, <coughs> a parent that is um, who has a child who rebels against the parent. Um, and a, par- a child can handle something. Uh, uh, the parent can handle the rebellion much more than the parent can deal with the uh, quarreling between siblings, or, or in general, that the child is not well adjusted in life. It's something that's more difficult to, as for for a parent to to see to see that the child is not doing well, um, or not treating people with respect, or not getting along with their siblings or their friends or whatever, and not adjusting well to life. Um, as opposed to some, as opposed to uh, to to rebelling against the parent, which which a parent can much more easily swallow, so to speak. Anyway, so that's the that's the lesson from that. So it says that 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 okay. So getting back to the medrash about Nayach, so 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 uh, uh, um, uh, about a hundred years before, um, give or take, uh, before the Mabel, so it says, um, I'm sorry, before Hashem came to Noach and told him to build the Teva, which is 220 years before, roughly, give or take. So Hashem came to different people at the, in that generation and told them that there's an exceeding amount of corruption and so on in the world, and he's going to destroy the world. Um, and he warned them, and he told them, tell the people that they have to change their ways, they have to do tshuva. And the people didn't listen. And Hashem decided to bring a small marble. It says that he, 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 he flooded... One of the rivers, one of the one of the major rivers, I think it was the Gichain, but I'm not. Uh, I don't have the, the text in front of me. But um, uh, he overflooded one of the rivers, uh, one of the major rivers, the huge rivers that, that run through the, the that uh, that area of the world, and he flooded, um, and, and it was a massive, massive flood. And this massive flood killed uh, like a third of the like a third of the world, a third of the population at the time. Um, and the people that uh, and the people that originally said about this, or the prophesied about this, came and told the people that this is what's going to happen, and this is when it's going to happen, and you should know that this is the you know that Hashem doesn't want to do this, and you have to if you do tshuva, it will it'll be avoided, and so on and so forth. And then it came, and then they said that this is what happened because of what we said, and there was a lot of warnings. It wasn't just one day. So Hashem decided, okay, that's it. I'm sick of this whole thing, and make a boat, and 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 uh, we're going to destroy the whole world. There was a lot of warnings, and there was even many floods that happened before. Um. And so on. And then when Hashem told Nayach to build a Teva, also Hashem, uh, uh, Nayach took 120 years to build a Teva. And the purpose of that was is that people should ask, that people should, should inquire, uh, and people should have a chance as, as to what Nayach is doing, and they should have a chance to also to do Tshuva. 
Um, as we know, they didn't. They laughed at him. They thought it was uh, it was a big joke. Even after what happened with the with the with the flood that happened uh, 100 years earlier, or whatever, 50 years earlier, 70 years earlier, um, and and they continued in their ways, and then things only gotten worse. Uh, got worse. Ultimately, that's where we know the story. Noach built the, built the teva. He built the he built the 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 the, um, the, uh, the boat. Um, okay. Uh, Hashem told him you should bring seven animals of kosher and two animals, male and female, of non-kosher. And then, of course, him and his wife, Nayach, and his wife, I believe her name was Nama, um, if I recall correctly. And then and then her, her, his three sons, Shem, Cham, and Yafes. Um, and they're, and they're, they're three wives. Um, interestingly enough, Shem, Cham, and Yafes, even though they were not young at the time of the flood, did not have any children. It's a kind of a funny thing. And I found somewhere in Medrash that it says that it's because of all of the things that happened in the 100, 200 years prior, where, and th- that they believed that the, that the flood was going to come, they didn't know that if they had children, if they would be saved from the flood. And so therefore they did not have children all of those years in order uh, because they because they didn't know what was going to be with them. And they refrained from having children until after the flood, and then only after that did they populate the earth. <coughs> and that's why only those eight people entered and exited the, the Teva. Now, we have a famous uh, 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 discussion about Nayach, if he was a righteous person um, or not, or if he was only righteous in his generation. It says that that, that, uh, that Nayach, in the Pasuk it says, Nayach tamim hayab deraisav. It says that he was um, a tzaddik in his generation. So it can be interpreted in different ways that he was a tzaddik in spite of the fact that that everyone else in his generation wa, was wicked. And that shows his great sit because it shows his great righteousness um, because uh, because to be righteous amongst an entire population, there was no one else that was... Uh, um, uh, there was no one else that, uh, that, that was righteous, that, that believed in God at that time, uh, that was worthy of, being, of, of saving. He was the only person that believed in God and, and, and he fought with the whole world. Uh, you know, he, he was the crazy person, uh, much like Avram Avinu. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, that, that he was only righteous on a curve. He was only righteous based on uh, the other people that lived in the generation, which means he was more righteous than them, which isn't a, a very high bar to reach. They were very corrupt and very uh, and very um, and very wicked, and so therefore, being uh, more righteous than them is very simple. You just have to be a little, you know, a little bit, you know, you have to be moral. That's it. So these two different, uh, two different opinions. These two opinions are also brought in Rashi. Um, that one opinion says that it says that he made a tsayar la teva. Uh, it says in the pasuk that he made a tsayar for the teva for the for the for the, for the boat. He made a tsayar. Rashi asks, what is a tsayar? And so he brings two opinions there. One opinion is that the tsayar is a window. And another opinion is that tsayar is a very precious and brilliant stone. And regardless of if it was a window or if it was a stone, the purpose of the, win- of the window or stone was in order to provide light for the, for the, um, for the teva. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the Rebbe explains that the, that the reason for these two opinions fits with the two opinions that either he was a righteous person or 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 not one opinion is is that um is that he was worthy of 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 seeing the destruction that was going on around him and and therefore there was a window and then uh, according to the other opinion he was not so righteous and he wasn't worthy of seeing the destruction around him um and and therefore it was a stone um, this also goes into uh, how the Teva was built. We see a lot of pictures or, uh, you know, uh, kids um, coloring books and so on for uh, on the Parsha. And it shows that, that, the, that, the, that the Ark was built as a boat where it was pointed in the front. Uh, now, the truth is, is that in the Psukim, it doesn't say that, that, that Hashem told him that he should make it pointed in the front. Now, it's very possible that it was. It's very possible that Neuch built it that way. Um, and those things went without say, that there was a certain certain nautical science that goes in into building a boat. And, uh, and Neuch understood that, and so therefore he did it. But according to other opinions, Hashem told him that he should build the Teva as a, as a rectangular box with three floors, which is, which is the dimensions that are given in the, in the Chumash. And according to some opinions, that's exactly how we built the ark—that it was that it was a square, rectangular, 
box, and that's it. Now, uh, if you know even the smallest amount about 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 how boats work, if you don't, if if the boat doesn't come to a point in the front that cuts through the water, so then it's going to be a very very uncomfortable um, uh, sea voyage uh, because because instead of the boat cutting through the water, the boat is going to get slammed by the water from all sides and the waves that will come from all sides. So again, this also follows the opinion, these different opinions that that if that if Noach was tr- if Noach was truly worthy of being saved, or he was only t- better than everyone else that was in the that was in the story. Um, all right. Uh, after after um, after the flood, so it says that, 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 that it rained for forty days and forty nights. After forty days and forty nights, uh, the rain stopped, but until the 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 water seceded. Um, and until dry land emerged, um, it took a full year, a full year from when the when Noach and his children went into the went into the into the teva until they came out. <coughs> Excuse me. It took a full year. They were a full year in the teva. Uh, it says that Noach worked so hard. It says he he coughed blood. He 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 would. Uh, he would cough blood from the from the tireless work, day and night, the feeding and tending to the animals. It says Noach became lame because he was swiped by one of the animals uh, on his leg, um, uh, because he didn't bring him the food fast enough, or he didn't, or he gave someone, he gave one animal the food before the other one. And there's a, a whole bunch of other different midrashim about what happened in the table with the animals and so on and so forth, which uh, is available uh, to read. Um, okay, so Shira, we're getting to your question in just a second. Um, okay, so then after 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 a little less than a year, um, it says that the that the after a certain amount of days, the water seceded enough that the that the tops of the mountains were 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 viewable, where it could be seen over the water, um, and the and the teva came to rest on. Uh, a mountain that the Torah calls Har Ararat, which is translated as Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat is a is a mountain that exists today, assuming that it's the same mountain. The Mount Ararat is a, is a mountain that that's in Turkey. It's a very uh, today. It's a very very high mountain. Um, so much so that even though Turkey is a is a is a southern European or, or Middle Eastern country, or even you can call it a Mediterranean country. Uh, nevertheless, there is there's constantly snow at the peaks of uh, of Mount Ararat, and it's therefore very difficult to climb. Recently, researchers uh, climbed the mountain. Not so recently. This is maybe I don't know, ten years ago, maybe twenty years ago. I don't know. I I saw the research maybe ten years ago, something like that. About about um, about uh, Chinese or Japanese explorers that went to Mount Ararat and they found what they believe is the remnants of the ark. It's frozen pieces of wood that are very very long. Um, that fit the the dimensions of the teva um, that have been frozen and 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 become fossiled in the um, in the snow in the in the ice and so there's remnants of the of the teva. So of course these are a lot of assumptions. I'm just sharing this information with you because I find it interesting. But uh, of course the, you know we, we we don't know if it's the right mountain. We don't know if if it's actually the the, the teva or if it's something else. You know, but this is the information that's available. Um, okay, so the so Nach, so so Nach wanted uh, so after a little while longer, the water continued to recede and continued to recede, and now we have to remember that this wasn't just a, a, a forty-day rainstorm. There was water that came from below as well. It says that Hashem opened up the water that exists beneath the ground, the, the massive water uh, storages that, that that exist beneath the ground, and water uh, 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 gushed from from beneath the ground. All the wells and the seas and the and the, and like I said, the water from the depths of the earth all surged up into the earth and literally turned the earth over. Um, and that's why when Noach came out, it says that he saw a new land. He says he saw a new world, because that's what it is. Everything had been turned over. There was no trees. There was no there was no nothing. And the landscape of the, of the world also had completely changed, because the earth had literally been turned upside down. Um, um, and all the animals and all the people and so on were all buried underneath the ground. They, they didn't come out and see hundreds of thousands of people uh, decomposing in different places of the world or bones everywhere. These, they, all, everything was like the whole world was turned upside down. 
um, and and receded, and, every, and anything that was there prior uh, was all was all pulled down into the earth when the water receded uh, into the earth. So this took about a year. Towards the end of the year, uh, Noach wanted to know if uh, if the water had receded enough, and and he sent out the three. Um, he sent out the dove and the raven, and first the first the raven and the raven this uh, circle encircled the the teva and didn't want to go, and then he came back in, and then he sent the dove. The dove went and and um, and came back with a leaf, uh, which says that it was from Eretz Yisrael, which was uh, less affected or less touched by the by the marble. <coughs> And then, um, and then, and then, and then, after a little while, he sent the dove out again, and the dove did not return. Which means, which he, he understood as a sign that there was that there was land, that there was somewhere that had uh, that that the um, that the water had receded enough for the dove to land and to live. <clears throat> and as such, he understood that the water had receded in certain places enough that they could leave the teva. But because Hashem told them to go into the teva, Hashem also Noach also needed. <clears throat> the answer or the or the directive from Hashem to leave the teva, and he waited for that. And like I said, that came a year after they went into the teva. And uh, and when they did, they came out. They came out. All the animals were, were were let out. All the people came out, and they made their way down the mountain and uh, and so on. Um, and the story continues that um, that it says that uh, that Noach thanked Hashem. He built a mizbeach for Hashem. He sacrificed animals. Hashem in, in thanks. It says that Hashem thereafter brought the, the rainbow to promise that he would never bring a marvel again to destroy the entire world. Although the, the, there's there's a, um, Hashem did not promise that that, that there weren't there wouldn't be horrible uh, things that would happen that would uh, that would destroy small parts of the world, but for the entire world, he said he would never do again in the way that he did in the way that he did the marvel. Um, and that's it. And people continued uh, living their life. It says that Noach opened the yeshiva uh, with his grandson Aver, which uh, was born later, obviously. Um, and that's the famous yeshiva of Shem Aver that uh, that Avram Avinu uh, learned in, and then Yaakov went to after he escaped from his parents' house on a way to, a way to love him. That he lived there for fourteen years learning Torah, um, and that's what Shem did. Uh, according to one of the uh, Madrashim, um, according to many Midrashim, uh, he, he lived a sh- shame um, in, during the times of Avram Avinu lived in, a, in, in, in Yerushalayim. He was called Malkit Tzedek. Um, and Avram Avinu went to him. Of course, uh, Noach was, was Avram's Rebbe. He was his teacher. He taught him Torah and so on. And, uh, and, so, and so he went to him for many things, uh, advice and so on, including when Hashem told him, when Hashem told Avram Avinu that he should, um, he should circumcise himself he went to um, he went to Noach, who was then Malki Tzedek, to consult with him or to ask him about it. Um, okay, but that's I'm jumping ahead. So that was uh, so, so that's Noach. Okay, so uh, the so then you have Shem Cham and Yafes. Shem Cham and Yafes all uh, po- began to populate the world. Their children and children's children and so on and so forth. So by and large. Uh, the way to answer Shira's question, which nations came from Shem Chom and Yafes? So uh, it goes basically like this. It says that the children of Yafes are what we know today as the move to the far eastern region, which is what we understand today is is the is the Oriental people, just uh, by and large in 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 in, in broad strokes. Um, um, Cham had many children. If you look in the Chumash, you see the different children that he that he had, and it's pretty easy to figure it out because Shem and Cham had had different children. Those children's names are uh, names of countries, uh, names like Mitzrayim, names like Yavon, names like Cush, and others. And so each one of these people went to different places in the world, and they established countries, and it became known as Eretz Kush, or Eretz Mitzrayim, or Eretz Yavan, and so on. And and each one of these different people um, ha- had children, and children's children, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And and they populated that area, and they were known, and, 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 and so therefore, the what comes out of that, or what we understand from that, is that, for the most part, the entire world was very tribal. 
uh, which means that all of these countries, there weren't just, just random names of countries, uh, Greece and Egypt and, and Ethiopia. These were names of people. These were the, this was the name of the patriarch of the tribe. And so all the people that lived in that place <coughs> were descendants of that person. Um, now, jumping ahead, uh, uh, where are we, whatever, 1,500 years, um, or a thousand years? No, where are we? I'm losing track of the dates. Where are we now? If we're in, uh... yeah, about fifteen hundred years. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Sancherev. Sancherev was a king of uh, or general of uh, the king of Ashur, uh, which is today modern day Syria, and he and he believed in equality. He was the first. Uh, he was the first Marxist. And he decided that all of the world's problems came from um, tribalism. And so therefore he mixed up the world. And so therefore, even though today the names of the countries are, are still stuck, we still have uh, Greece and, and, and Egypt and Ethiopia, but the people that live there are no longer from that tribe because the people have already been all mixed up. He would take people from one country and take them to another country and the people from that country would take them to another country. And he would drop different people off in different places from different uh, different nationalities to spread all these tribes all throughout the the world, and so that people should just be citizens of the world; they shouldn't be tribes. Um, but uh, but that's it. But that's how the people. But that's how, but that was fifteen years, hundred years later, um, which means that when the Jewish people went down to Mitzrayim, so all the people that lived there, the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, were descendants of a guy by the name of Mitzrayim. Um, yeah. So that's so that's uh, so that's what happened, and they dis they dispersed to different places and set up uh, colonies in different in different countries and different areas in the world, and from there all of their descendants grew and became um, the nations of the world as they are today. <coughs> um, what else do we have? Okay, so uh, with a few minutes that are remaining, let's try and uh, review the ten generations from Nayach Tavram. So, 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 like I said, Noach left the Teva with his three children and their wives. They started to populate the world. So, three generations, four generations after already, people started to populate the world. And it says that they lived in um, in different places. And then the, 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 there was a central group of people that lived in Bavel, <coughs> Babylonia, and um, and they lived. And then, and then, as the people got bigger, they moved to a big, huge. Uh, valley called uh, Shinar, and it says it was exceedingly large, and they were able to they 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 they, they, they went there because they saw that, that this was a place where they could build a city, a modern city, a place where they can really establish humanity, really establish uh, you know civil society, um, and so therefore they went there. Um, and after another few generations, people started to get together and say, "Listen, look at all these things we built." And look at all these, uh, you know, the population that we've, it's taken us so many generations to repopulate the world and even to come up with the amount of people that, uh, that, that exist today and all the, and the city that exists today. And, you know, we, 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 we built this not only with our families, but also our, our blood, sweat and tears. How do we know that Hashem is not going to come along one day and just decide that he's sick of us and he's going to destroy everything again? So they decided, uh, they, came, they came upon this plan. The plan was is that they're going to, they're going to build this massive tower <clears throat> and they're going to ascend into the heavens, and they're going to fight with with God, and either make an agreement or negotiate with God, depending on how you know. Like I said, different people had different uh, ideas about what this whole what this tower was for, but it was a way. It, it was a way to 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 protect the Jewish the, the 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 population of the world to protect the people of the world, and. Um, and and not to allow a, a marble to happen again. It says that the tower was so high that it literally reached the sky, it pierced the heavens, and it says that it was so high that it took a person to walk up, in order to walk from the ground all the way up to the peak of the of the tower, it took an entire year, an entire year. You can imagine what this means, the magnitude of the of the project, the also the size of the tower. That means that you would have to have um, places for people to live in the tower and food and so on. You know, an entire an entire civilization had to exist in different points all throughout the tower going up in order to, because people didn't go down the tower <clears throat> and go home and then come back the next day. 
and then continue working on the tower. Because if it would take a year to get all the way to the top, uh, you know, nothing would ever get done. So people would be at the top and they would finish working and they would have to sleep there and then wake up and continue working. So that means that a whole civilization or a whole infrastructure of life had to exist on different levels of the tower. At every, you know, every few hours, there had to be another sort of landing post. It's, just a, it's a phenomenal thing to think about how that was set up uh, logistically. Um, but that gives you a sense of, <clears throat> of <clears throat> excuse me, about how, how tall the, 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 the tower was and also how wide it must have been and what was the different things that existed on the tower through uh, uh, all the way from the top to the bottom. It says that the tower was so precious. It says that even if one, if a stone fell, people were more upset than if a person fell. Because if a stone fell, it would take another year for the stone to get all the way back up. But if a person fell, there was another person and everyone just moved over, uh, you know, one step. You know, The assembly line just moved over one. They, they didn't lose time. But if a brick fell, if a brick fell, so then, um, so then they lost a year that the brick ascended all the way up into the, into the, into the tower. Um, okay, so the Chumash continues to tell the story that after they finished building the tower, Hashem sent down uh, a fire, and it incinerated the top third of the of the. Um, well, I'm jumping ahead. I'm jumping ahead. So, so Hashem decided that he needs to disperse all these people, and that's why the country eventually was called Bavel. Bavel comes to the word uh, Bilbo. Uh, that people were confused. It was the country of confusion or dispersion uh, because that's what happened. People started speaking different languages. Hashem placed languages into people's heads. Uh, one person asked for a hammer and the other person gave him a, a stone or a brick and he didn't understand what and where. And no, suddenly no one understood each other. And there was a, a tremendous, tremendous billboard, tremendous uh, confusion. Um, <coughs> and therefore, um, people started to disperse. They found people that um, that, that understood each other, they understood, the people that understood their language, and they grouped together with those people, and they went to different places in the world. And that's another level of how language w- w- was introduced into, into the world and how that language dispersed to different parts of the globe. Um, or at that time, whatever, Mesopotamia, the Middle East, what have you. Um, the tower itself, it says, Hashem sent, after people dispersed, uh, it says Hashem sent a fire down into the um, into the world and uh, onto the tower, and he incinerated the top third of the tower. He says that the it says that the that the bottom third, the earth opened up and swallowed. And it says the middle third stands there t- until this very day. Um, I don't have any research that I found as to archaeo- archaeo- archaeologists that have found this 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 third uh, or where it is it's possible that at this point it's already buried very very deep uh, beneath the ground after you know earth shifts and so on all throughout the thousands of years um or it could be that it's still there and um and i just haven't heard of anyone that discovered it yet um so that's that so that was the that's that was a further that was a further dispersion and spreading of people and so on uh, this all happened, incidentally, during the childhood of Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu grew up in uh, under the under the ruling under the rule of a person by the name of Nimrod. who was a very powerful king. He also lived for a very a very long amount of time. Uh, it's it's important to note also that uh, that while people lived for seven, eight, nine hundred years before the flood, as soon as the flood happened, Hashem started to shorten the length of days of people. So while Neach lived uh, many hundreds of years. Um, but Avraham Avinu, for instance, 10 generations later, only lived for 175. Um, and so therefore, as the generations went by, and that was 10 generations later, so as the generations went, people started living to only 600 years, and then 500 years, and 350 years, and so on. And it started to, to get less and less and less as time went by. Uh, and that's why when, when Nayak died, uh, Avraham Avinu was 58 years old, because Nayak lived for such a long amount of time, which was something that didn't really take place later on, as we see that Avraham Avinu died when, uh, Avraham Avinu died when his grandchildren, Yaakov and, uh, Yaakov and Esau were only children. Now, we, that's, that's obviously because they, you know, he didn't have children until he was a hundred years old, but, um, but the, um, but the lifespan of people didn't go that far. Uh, um, fine. So that brings us to Avraham Avinu, Avraham Avinu. Uh, uh, grew up under the ruling of Nimrod. Nimrod, uh, as we all know the story, 
with Nimrod, Nimrod at the, the, the night of Nimrod's, uh, the, the, the night of Avraham Avinu's birth, Nimrod astrologers saw that uh, that uh, that Avraham Avinu was going to uh, overthrow his uh, his, uh, his 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 um, his kingdom, and uh, and it pointed to a guy by the name of Terach and his child, uh, who was then named Avram, and Nimrod ordered that the child should be should be should be murdered. Instead, uh, Terach brought the, the servant's child and sent his child into hiding. Uh, and that's where, during that time, eventually Avram met um, Noyach and where he learned by him and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, there's different opinions in the, in the Midrashim as to what age did Avram Avinu recognize Hashem. Uh, according to one opinion, Avram Avinu recognized Hashem at a tender age of three years old. And according to other opinions, uh, it wasn't until his 40s and 50s that he recognized Hashem. And, uh, and all the stories that subsequently came out, of the, came out after that about him uh, giving up his life uh, and being thrown into the furnace and, and breaking all the idols in his father's idol store um, and so on will happen later on. Uh, according to the first opinion, of course, it happened when he was younger. Um, and then because of this, the different things that happened, they sent him away uh, in order to literally save his life because um, it wasn't acceptable for people not to believe in idols during that time. That was it. It was just idolatry was the thing. And if you, and if you didn't believe in it, so then you were, you were a dangerous person and, uh, and you were crazy. And that's why he was called Avram Ivri, Ivri, which today we, we, we translate loosely as being Hebrew. What we call Avram the, the Hebrew, or the, the, the people that the uh, people that came out of Avram were called the Hebrews. But really, Ivri means uh, it could mean one of two things. Ivri means that he lived Me'ever Hayardain. He lived on the other side. Ever Ivri comes from the word Ever from the other side. That he lived on the other side of the Jordan River. Most people did not live there. Most people lived uh, in Bavel and in Turkey and Syria and so on. Um, and so he lived in Ever Ayyadin. He lived on the other side of the Jordan, which is where Hashem sent him to go um, to the land of Canaan. Another opinion is, is that Ivri, which doesn't contradict the first opinion, it could be both, is that Ivri means he's the guy from the other side, meaning he's the he's the different guy. He's the guy that's different. He's the guy that, that thinks that thinks different. He's the he's the guy that sets himself apart apart from everyone else. He's there's the whole world, and then there's Avram. Everyone's on one side, and Avram is on the other. Um, and that's what happened. Avram fought, so to speak, uh, with the whole world. He he convinced people, or he 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 spoke to people, uh, forbrained with people in, in the in the hotel that he opened up in his his own tent that he that was constantly open. It says he had doors on all four sides of his tent, and he was always waiting for guests. Um, and he would talk to the people there about how the greatness of God and and that the God exists and that God is a thing and and that idolatry is not correct and so on and so forth. And in this way, he made a lot of gerim. He, he brought a lot of people closer to serving Hashem and only one God. And, and he introduced this concept, which hadn't been practiced as a as a movement ever in the history of the world, which is called monotheism, which is uh, believing in one God. Um, and so Avram Avinu in the land of Canaan. Um, so 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 when when Avram Avinu got, got older, um, Hashem told him, Lech lecha ma'atzacha, you should go out of your land, you should go to live in the land of Canaan. And he went there and he became a very wealthy person. But it didn't happen right away. First he came there and then there was a famine and then he came there and he, and he had to go down to Egypt and then to Gerar. And, he had, and his wife was kidnapped and uh, he had fights with the four kings and the five kings. And there was a lot of tests. And all the things that Hashem told him to do, or, or all the things that Hashem told him that would happen, uh, there were many contradictions. Um, words, he told him he'd go to the land of Canaan, and then as soon as he came to Canaan, he had to leave because there was a famine. And then he told him that he's going to make him wealthy, and then, and then again, there was a famine, and then he had problem, he had other problems. And it took time for all these prophecies to come through, and all this was testing his faith, testing Avraham Avinu's faith that he was going to uh, stay true uh, and believe in what Hashem told him, and not to and not to lose faith. So that that happened for the this was called the ten tests of Avram. And then finally, um, and so you have the you have the you have the uh, you have that he was he was thrown into a fiery furnace. And you have that he, he came to that he was told to leave his birthplace and come to Canaan. That there was the famine. That there was the, the that his his nephew Light was was 
was kidnapped, that he went to go fight with the with the kings, and so on and so forth. That, that is, he was told that he was going to have a child, um, that he, and then finally the tenth test was that he was told that he should bring his child up to Hare Maria and to sacrifice him to Hashem. That was the tenth tenth test. Once once that test was uh, was was passed, Hashem told him that he he made a covenant with him and he promised him that the Jewish people. His, his, his children will be the Jewish people, and those children will be in a covenant with him forever. Um, um, after that, Avram Avinu sent Eliezer to go find a wife for Yitzchak. That's Yitzchak, uh, uh, he brought back Rivka. Rivka and Yitzchak got married. They didn't have children for many years. And then uh, 22 years, and then after that, they had, they had twins, Yaakov and Esav. And uh, Esav was, uh, was not righteous. And very tricky, and very, 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 um, very sneaky. And Yaakov was a more of a simple uh, and straightforward child, and he was righteous. Um, and it says that Yaakov uh, stole the blessings from his his, his father, from his father Yitzchak, and then he ran away to, to the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, and then it was subsequently to, to, to Lavan, his his uncle, and he married uh, Yaakov and Leah. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Rachel and Leah. Uh, not in that order. First Leah, and then Rachel. Although he thought it was supposed to go the other way, and then eventually also their um, their half sisters, their 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 maid servants, um, Bilha and Zilpa. Bilha was Rachel's uh, uh, servant, and Zilpa was Leah's. Um, and they have had over there. They had uh, eleven children. After Yosef was born, he left uh, Haran, which is where Lavan lived, and they went uh, and they went away, and they went back to Canaan. Uh, on the way, Lavan came uh, to, 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 to meet them and to try to draw them back and so on. And Rachel had stolen the, the idols from her, her father's house. And, and Lavan accused him of doing so. And he said that anyone that, that I never stole anything and no one in my household has stolen anything. We're not thieves. And if you find, uh, that, you know, if you find the, 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 that anyone stole it, that person will die. Um, and even though... And even though Yaakov didn't know what he, what he meant, what he was saying and so on, but the reality is that Rachel stole... These things from his her father's house, and that's why subsequently on the way, um, when she was expecting their their the Yaakov's twelfth twelfth child, twelfth son, Benjamin, she died in childbirth and childbirth and was eventually buried on the way um, in in um, in Beis Lechem. Um, Eventually, Yaakov came back to the to the house of his father to to, to for, for, first to Shechem, and then the whole story with Dina happened, and the war there, and so on, and uh, they killed out the entire people, and then um, and then and then they came uh, to Beersheba, to Chevron, to Beersheba, and um, and then and then the story with Yosef began. Yosef and his dreams, and the jealousy of the brothers, and subsequently the the brothers selling Yosef into into Egypt. Egypt Yosef came down to Egypt. He became ten years. He sat in prison. He worked for this guy by the name of Petifar, and then he was thrown ten years to, uh, into prison, which eventually became twelve years. He eventually came out and he interpreted Pari's dream and told him about the famine that would come. That that famine eventually brought, uh, you know, was the subsequent uh, uh, catalyst that brought. Yaakov and the other uh, eleven siblings, eleven brothers, down to Mitzrayim, and thus began the and thus began the story of the slavery of the Jewish people in Egypt, which we which we are celebrating soon uh, in the in the holiday of Pesach, the exodus of the Jewish people from from Mitzrayim. The Jewish people were there for two hundred and ten years. Um, the real uh, Shibu, the real uh, slavery, didn't begin until after the Shvatim passed away, so it was for a much shorter amount of time. Um, but was still very, very hard during those years. Um, we can't really possibly fathom how intensely difficult the, the Golas of Mitzrayim was, um, but it was extremely, extremely intense and intense and extended for, for a very, very long period of time, decades. Um, and then after that, finally, Moshe Rebbe was chosen, uh, and he came, he brought 10 plagues upon the, the Mitzrayim, and then the Jewish people left the land of, of Mitzrayim, wandered 40 years in the desert, received the Torah, 49 days later, wandered for 40 years in the desert, and then eventually came to, to the land of Israel. Maish Rabbeinu was not allowed to go into the land of Israel, and he and he's buried uh, in Har Navai, which is in the on the other side of the Jordan River, and Yeshua took the Jewish people into, into the Promised Land um, and fought the wars over 14 years. 
and um, and settled the land. Seven years of wars and seven years of settling the land and placing the different shvatim, the different tribes in different places uh, throughout the land uh, of Israel, setting up where each per- each tribe's section section was. Subsequently, uh, Yeshua passed away after fourteen years, and and began the era of the sh- the era of the shvatim. Um, I think that's I think that's my time. So we'll pick up um, next time. Uh, was probably after Pesach, um, uh, with uh, with Yeshua and the Shaftim, and uh, and the beginning of the settlement of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, uh, which spans all the way till the destruction of the first base of Migdash, um, which is after David and after Shaul and after Shlema and after the splitting of the of the um, of the kingdoms to Machas Yehuda Machas Yisrael, and uh, and the loss of the ten tribes that we talked about uh, last time. Uh, so we'll go into that a little bit more in depth uh, the next time we meet. Have uh, a wonderful day, and uh, and everyone should be healthy and well. <laughs>